with a building that will use uh, walls as the main uh, resisting system to horizontal actions. The first part will deal with cantilever walls and the second part will deal with uh, coupled walls and torsional problems. Uh, I, I'd like to anticipate that the use of uh, uh, cantilever walls or coupled walls is probably uh, something that is going to increase in the future for earthquake resistant design. The reason is that there is more and more uh, attention to the problem of uh, serviceability or anyway low damage limit state, which implies that you may need to design for lower uh, displacements and it is difficult to design for small displacements when you are only using frame buildings. So this is particularly true for relatively tall structures where, uh, in my opinion, from my point of view, in the future we will see more and more a combination of uh, some structure which will be essentially devoted to, the, to carrying a vertical load and some other structure will be mainly oriented to uh, resisting horizontal forces. Talking about uh, walls, it has to be recognized that there can be a number of uh, different uh, combinations of walls, and in many cases they will not be necessarily symmetric, so the problems can become uh, complex. We will, I will mainly talk about simple walls with a section with a section which is like the first one here on, on your left, uh, which is a kind of a section that is simple to realize and, and so on, but can have some problem, particularly uh, related to the fact that there could be some uh, problem when the out-of-plane response is combined with a strong ductility demand in the plane of the wall. And in the past, there have been cases where some collapse or heavy damage has been uh, due to this combination of out-of-plane and in-plane force. And when we are dealing with uh, walls, for example, of this sort, uh, as I will discuss briefly in, 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 in this presentation, uh, there, there is the additional problem of a different response depending on the direction of the action. And this may increase the difficulties and I would also maybe say that not everything is clear, not related to displacement-based design, but related to seismic design in general when you're dealing with this kind of walls. And of course, this can be increased when you have walls that have other uh, kind of non-symmetry in, the two, in, the, in at least one direction uh, and needs more study in the future. So uh, I was saying that the first part will deal with cantilever walls of this sort. In the second part, there will be some discussion on uh, uh, combination of walls, coupled walls, and uh, uh, just to anticipate briefly problems that will be discussed later, you will immediately note that in a case of coupled walls of this sort, you are probably going to have some critical regions, critical problems in the coupling beams. It, it will be easy to see, and actually I should not use the word easy anymore, it will be possible to see that the uh, angle that will be required to the connection to the, couple, to the, to the coupling beam is always larger than the uh, rotation which is implied at the base of the uh, vertical uh, walls and therefore there will always be a larger displacement ductility or rotation ductility demand in the, uh, in the coupling beam. Walls of this sort are, are less interesting from a certain point of view in the sense that it is difficult here to recognize uh, walls coupled because it is likely that the problems will raise up in uh, elements that are more uh, short columns than, uh, than, than, than coupling beam and this is, uh, implies different problems and uh, possibly a more significant potential for uh, soft story production. When you look at, at walls uh, uh, and you look what happened in the past, and in this presentation there are only three or four slides to look at problems in the past, but in the recent earthquake in Chile there has been much more evidence uh, of problems of, uh, of walls. But you can see in cases like this that not necessarily the problems are always at the base of the, of the wall. 
uh, problems uh, at the higher level could be originated by, vert by vertical irregularity. And you can see here very clearly that there are kind of uh, shear problems at a certain level in the structure, but could also be due to uh, the effect of uh, higher modes, as I will discuss more uh, later. In this case, you see uh, something which is uh, related to the problem that I was already mentioning. This is a relatively slender wall with a local problem of, uh, of uh, out-of-plane uh, uh, force or instability in a certain way, uh, combina combined with uh, a high value of the overturning moment, and therefore with a high value of local vertical uh, stresses. In general, while we design something, design a cantilever wall, there are a few uh, principle, a few fundamental issues that have to be considered. One is that we always assume that plastic hinges should form only at the wall base. The second point is that higher mode effects could be essential, could be essential, and this is a subject that will be discussed in the sense that without considering in a proper way higher mode effects, there could be uh, very much higher shear demand in the lower part of the wall and the consequent, uh, a consequently some shear failure. And uh, uh, in relation to uh, the formation of plastic hinge, it is fundamental to have a careful detailing of the, transversal, of the transverse reinforcement. Transverse not only for shear problems, but transverse also for confining problems. Uh, we will see that if uh, in a wall we want to uh, have a, a large concentrated rotation capacity, we need to have a good confinement in the concrete to have uh, some significant increase in its uh, capacity of shortening, and this is not always uh, easy when you are dealing with a, uh, a wall which is uh, uh, normally rather thin. So this is just to give some, a couple of more examples. You can see that here there are uh, situations where it is possible that some collapse is essentially due to insufficient uh, transverse reinforcement in plastic hinge region. And in this case, it is on the opposite very clear that the, this kind of failure, uh, and this is just an enlargement of this area here, there have been problems of higher mode effects. Uh, the reason why I am saying that it is clear that this is a problem of higher mode effects is that this uh, uh, this kind of collapse seems to be due more to flexural problems than to shear problems. And in fact, you see here in the enlargement that uh, the uh, vertical reinforcement has gone out of the plane and it's, it has reached instability, which means that uh, in a way the bending moment there has been likely to be higher than what was assumed during the uh, design phase at a higher level with respect to the base. Now, uh, Nigel has been discussing uh, uh, in detail what uh, happens and what should be done in the case of frames. When we are dealing with walls, uh, a few aspects are significantly different. First of all, uh, if you consider the problem of limiting the drift, which is uh, uh, related to non-structural damage, as we have been already discussing, while in frame structure, you normally expect to have uh, uh, the code uh, uh, drift uh, that governs. In walls, it is much more likely to have problems with strain limits. But when the drift is, uh, is the crucial uh, parameter, what happens is that in frames, it is more common to have uh, the critical drift uh, at the lower, at uh, the fifth floor, at the lower, in the lower part of the frame, while in the case of walls, the opposite is the case. And uh, this may be not immediate to, uh, to be uh, seen. I will, I will show it why this happens, but the larger drift normally is at the, at the top floor. This is due to the different uh, elastic mode uh, of the formation of the wall with respect to the, to the frame. The Anyway, what, what I will try to do now is essentially to go through the usual steps that we have been discussing this morning and yesterday to uh, have some displacement-based design of a structure which is based on, on resisting wall and therefore to see what, how can be uh, de determined the um, 
design displacement and the yield displacement and therefore the ductility and from the ductility to obtain uh, the equivalent damping and so on, all the steps that permit to go from uh, a multi-degree of freedom structure to a single degree of freedom structure where it is possible to obtain the base shear uh, to be uh, used as a design strength for the walls. So first point, first point deals with the uh, maximum drift. The maximum drift, as I was saying, occurs normally in the top story, and uh, you can see it in this, in this figure. This figure is, is rather straightforward. You mean, I mean, assume that you have uh, a, a variation of the curvature along the height, which is essentially proportional to the shape of a bending moment. So this is rather straightforward. So you have a triangular shape where you have here uh, the, the curvature. Of course, I'm talking up to the elastic limit. And therefore, here you have the elastic curvature, which at, at this stage I, I approximate with two times the, the um, yield elongation of steel divided by the width of the wall, which is the same equation that we have been using yesterday. Well, if you do that, it is immediately to recognize that the rotation, the yield rotation, is at the top, is uh, essentially the integration of the curvature. And being the integration of the curvature is essentially this area. Therefore, it, it, it can be obtained multiplying this value by this value divided by 2. And you obtain something like this. You obtain that the rotation at the to in the top part here is essentially the yield elongation of the steel at yield multiplied by the height of the wall and divided by the width of the wall. By the way, keep in mind this uh, height divided by the width. This is, the, this is also called the aspect ratio of the, of the walls. And the aspect ratios will, will come back as a crucial parameter for designing the walls and also to realize whether uh, um, the yield uh, uh, situation will control or if uh, the wall is going to go into the uh, nonlinear range. Now, uh, if, uh, if, we, if, we have, uh, if we have now this uh, rotation at the top and we want to estimate the displacement at, the at any height of the wall, we can, uh, we can do the usual integration, which means to integrate the curvature multiplied by the height along the height of the, of the, of the wall. And I will show some more detail later on, but what's come out is something of this sort, where uh, this parameter comes out from the integration. So this is uh, this is the uh, this is the yield uh, the, the, is is the yield displacement along the height, and if you now want to look at the critical drift at the wall top, you should consider that this critical drift is given as the combination as the sum of the yield drift that you have up here and of the plastic uh, the, of the plastic uh, part of the of the rotation. So you have this part here, which is this part here, uh, as as already I explained. While the other part is what? Well, the other part is the plastic part. The plastic part is due to the rotation in the plastic, uh, in the plastic hinge region, so down here, and is essentially a linear uh, displacement profile, which means that the uh, total rotation at any height is essentially the sum of something which is constant, which is this part here, plus something which is not constant, which is this part here. So the second part of the sum, as you can see, is the usual, uh, is the usual expression where you have uh, uh, the plastic hinge length, which is this part here, multiplied by the uh, rotation that you have in the plastic hinge length. And this rotation that you obtain at the top of the wall here must be less than the acceptable rotation for uh, limiting the non-structural damage. So this theta sub c is the, this rotation. That could be maybe 2% or 2.5%. But anyway, if uh, this rotation here is larger than this, of course, you are not respecting the uh, non-structural limit. If you then look at the, dis uh, the design displacement profile and you want to know which, what, what the value is of the displacement at the height, again, you have the sum of the yield displacement at any height plus the uh, uh, plastic displacement at any height. And again, what, what changes is that for the plastic part, you have this part here, multiplied, which is the same that you had there, multiplied by the, um, the height, the level that you want to know the displacement, and this part here is this part here, 
that we already that we already considered. If you look at the if we look at the uh, displacement over the height, you can see here that we can make different assumptions of the uh, dimensionsless curvature along the height. And what is interesting to, to note is that if you if you assume to have this uh, uh, linear uh, cur uh, dimensionsless curvature, which is the one that I assumed uh, in the in the previous slide, we can compare it to more um, realistic, more uh, physical displacements, uh, uh, rot uh, dimens dimensionsless curvature, that here are indicated with uh, with uh, uh, this line number two, which is the one that you obtain applying the design forces, or with this line number four, which is the design forces which is modified considering the tension shift. You could also consider the fact in the upper part of the wall, you may have a region where you don't have cracking, you, you, in the, where, where the bending moment is lower than the cracking moment. Well, if you look at what happens in terms of displacement ratio, and you look at what happens at the equivalent height, which is approximately at 0.7 of the height of the wall, you can see that what you obtain in terms of displacement ratio, if you take uh, one given by the linear displacement here, it's 0 0.87, 0 0.86, on 1.03 in the case of uh, the line four, which is the one, which is the design forces plus the tension shift. And you can see this, this value is 1.03 with, with respect to one in the case of the linear displacement profile. Now, it is then immediately to see that uh, it is possible to assume this linear displacement profile, obtaining something which is acceptable in terms of uh, uh, the yield displacement. The formula that has been used to obtain this is the integration between 0 and 0.7 of the total height of the curvature multiplied by the height as usual to calculate the displacement. So uh, this is just to say that it is reasonable to assume this uh, displacement to calculate what the yield displacement will be. Now, uh, if we uh, look at the yield curvature for rectangular walls in uh, non-dimensional um, non form, taking, taking uh, the um, curvature times the width, the, the, the width of, the, of, the, um, of the wall, and we look at what happens looking at the, at the uh, uh, in, as a function of the axial load ratio and as, a f and as a function, yeah, in both cases, as a function of the axial road load ratio and as a function of the reinforcement. And we consider two cases. One case where the uh, reinforcement is concentrated at the wall ends, and in the other case, the uh, reinforcement is distributed along the width of the wall. We uh, found something rather interesting. We see that the results that we obtained are all uh, rather close to the usual expression, the expression where we say that the curvature is, uh, uh, can, be, can be calculated considering uh, a value which is in the range of two. And you can see that the uh, average in the case of a distribution of the, of the reinforcement is around 2.15, while in the case of the concentrated uh, uh, reinforcement at the two ends of, of the wall is 1.85. So in all cases, if you use 2 as this value, you are in the range that is, uh, roughly speaking, between plus minus 15%. Now, this is true for uh, walls with a rectangular section. If you look at walls with a T-section, like in this case, then you have a different response when the flange is in compression or when the flange is in tension. Actually, when the flange is in tension, the standard expression is reasonable. Uh, and is reasonable uh, with the different distribution of the reinforcement, but as we have seen, this is not a crucial point. While when the flange is in compression, uh, the, uh, the, the curvature is different because you have uh, a different uh, position of the neutral axis, and it is, more, uh, it is better approximated by a factor of 1.5. As I was saying, this, uh, the use of uh, walls of this sort uh, can create uh, problems because you have uh, different strengths and different stiffness in the opposite loading direction, and there is, sti there is still uh, a lot of work to do on this, on this subject. Now, what are the limits uh, uh, to the design ductility considering the yield drift? Well, uh, in this case, uh, uh, it is possible to look at this problem looking at the uh, yield rotation with the, with the usual expression, and to know that if uh, 
one wants to put some limit to the, uh, to the rotation, which is, for example, this 0.02, and one considers some possible value for the elongation of the steel, for example, this point 0.0022, that could be 0.02, 0.025, something like that, you end up with some uh, uh, limit of the aspect ratio in the range of 9 with those numbers that could be maybe 10 if you have 0.2% uh, um, as the limit, the plastic limit of, of steel. So uh, now if you, if you go ahead and you look at the maximum possible design ductility and you take uh, the, the equation that I already used which gives you the uh, yield displacement, uh, then you can, you can substitute uh, this value in here and what you obtain is a kind of an approximate equation where the uh, yield displacement uh, can be approximated with the 0.45, the elongation, the elongation of the steel at, at yield times the aspect ratio times the height of the wall. Taking then into consideration the plastic displacement, and the plastic displacement is here uh, again the, uh, the height of, the, of, the, of the, the, the equivalent height, multiply the, uh, the accepted curvature minus uh, the aspect ratio times the, uh, elongation, the elongation of the steel, you can obtain the system displacement ductility and you can obtain something, well, this is, a, this is a, a, a rigorous usual formula which is one plus the, um, the plastic displacement divided by the, curve, by the ill displacement and this can be approximated by something of this sort where there is simply been a substitution of this displacement in here and of this displacement in here. So the approximation is in this 0.45 that you have here. What happens if you look at this uh, ductility limit for cantilever walls based on code drift limits? Well, you, you will see immediately uh, looking at the at the elastic situation, which is down here, is a straight line, and uh, we are looking here at the maximum design ductility that you, that, you can op that you can use, you will immediately see that if you go beyond a level of, in this case, 9, because this is coherent with what we did in the previous, in the previous slide, you, you cannot anymore have any ductility that you can use, but you can use more and more ductility when you go towards the squatter wall. Squatter walls, here is two, two is a very squat wall, and here is three and four and so on. So this is the aspect ratio in the horizontal axis. And, and these two lines are, are obtained using a, a 0.02 as the um, acceptable rotation, and this, is, uh, and this is the other curve considering 0.025 as the acceptable rotation. And this other plot, the only difference is that the yield drift has been corrected with a, with a 0.7 value. So what, what we look, what we obtain out of, this, uh, out of these figures is that for uh, walls that have an aspect ratio which is uh, beyond, say, 10 or something like that, it is not possible to use uh, any ductility because the, um, the uh, maximum rotation due to non-structural uh, limit is, is governing the design. With, uh, in, with what, what, we can see, what we can see here is that if you put the ill displacement in, in, the vertical, in the vertical axis and here you have the aspect ratio, uh, what you, you could do is that, and, and, and you put the different lines for, curve, for um, walls of different height, when you have designed a certain wall you can enter in this plot and you can use this to go and see what happens in terms of uh, uh, comparing the yield displacement with the maximum displacement with, that corresponds in the, in the response spectrum to the uh, corner period. And going in here, you will see that, for example, in this case, for an aspect ratio equal to 6 and a wall of 48 meters in height, you enter here and you will end up reading that for a 0.3 GP ground acceleration, you will be uh, designing with, uh, with uh, um, considering the, um, the limiting curvature, the limit, the limit rotation due to non-structural elements and you will not have any um, plastic demand in the structure, while in, if you go in the other direction, you are going to have some plastic demand in the structure. 
Uh, this, of course, as I was saying, is, is, is our, our curvature obtained with the yield displacement equal to 0 0.45 times the elongation, uh, the yield elongation of the steel times the aspect ratio and times the height of the structure. Um, it is now necessary to go and have a look and discuss what the design profiles of, uh, of a cantilever wall will be. If the roof drift is less than the code drift, then uh, the design displacement will be given by the sum of the yield displacement at any level and the plastic displacement at any level. So uh, again, this uh, part here is the one that has already been used. This part here is uh, the part which is obtained considering the plastic curvature multiplied by the uh, plastic hinge length and multiplied by the height of the point where we want to know the displacement. Uh, in, on the opposite, if the code drift limit governs the roof drift, then the design profile is different because instead of having in this sec is equal in the part which is related to the elastic displacement shape, obviously, is different in the second part of this of the sum because in this part here you have the uh, plastic part due to the rotation at the base, while in this part here it's, you, have, you have the term which is governed by the limiting limit uh, rotation at the, top, at the top of the wall. Okay, finally, finally, I mean to, to fully understand what I was trying to discuss in this figure, you see what I was trying to show here in, in the sense that in this figure, you have uh, the, the, the description of the plastic hinge, which has a certain length and of a certain uh, curvature on this, on this height. So this uh, is to define what the plastic rotation is and therefore to calculate the plastic displacement at a certain height as a multiplication of the rot concentrated rotation here by the height of the structure. In, in, a, in, a, in a cantilever wall, the plastic hinge length can be approximated as a sum of three terms. Uh, it's not so different from what we do from, for, 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 um, for the case of a column. We have a term here which is uh, proportional to the height of the wall, a term which is proportional to the width of the wall, and the third, uh, and the third uh, term which is uh, essentially due to the uh, strain penetration of the reinforcement uh, in, uh, in the foundation and in the upper part of the wall. Now, what is, uh, uh, so this part is the, usual, is the usual term. For what concerns this part here, there is a factor K, which is essentially proportional to the strain hardening of the steel. This uh, is due to the fact that if the steel, the reinforcing steel has a large strain hardening, the plastic hinge length will be longer because the distance of the point where you have uh, a yield uh, uh, moment will be larger. And of the opposite, if, the, if, if you have uh, a ratio between the ultimate strength of the steel and the, and the um, yield strength of the steel is small, the, the distance between the section where you have the ultimate uh, moment and the section where you have uh, the yield moment will be smaller. If you look at this, at this value here, uh, and, well, the reason why it's, uh, it, it is appropriate to consider this, this ratio is that it, is, uh, it has become more and more common, certainly in Europe uh, and possibly in other parts of the world, to produce steel where this value is, uh, is very low with respect to the past. In the past, this value was commonly in the range of, say, 1.5 or something like that, the ratio between the ultimate strength and the yield strength of, of steel so if you look at this term here, this will become 1.5 minus 1, which is, uh, which is 0.5. And if you multiply 0.5 times 0.2, you will obtain 0.1 here. But uh, uh, today, uh, it is common to, have, uh, uh, to use steel where this ratio is in the range of, say, 1.1, 1.15, 1 1.2 maybe. And if you have here 0.2 times 0.2, it comes out to be 0.04 and these terms can be much, much smaller, and therefore uh, the uh, displacement due to 
the concentrated rotation at the base of the wall can be much less because the plastic hinge length is less. This will not affect the part related to the um, strain penetration and will not affect the part related to the width of the structure. It's obvious again, and we will use this something like this also for the case of masonry, that if you have a larger wall, you are going to have a, a, longer, uh, a longer potential for plastic hinge because of the inclination of the, of the, uh, of the cracks. Uh, so uh, we, have now, we have now all the ingredients also to calculate the, uh, the displacement, the plastic displacement due to the plastic hinge at the base of the wall. Now imagine now that the critical uh, situation is the strain at the base of the wall. If this is the case, we uh, can define different situations, for example, a ser serviceability situation as a function of the strain of the steel that we accept or of the end, more than or of the concrete shortening as the base of the wall. For example, we could assume uh, an elongation of the steel of 1.5%. This could be one, could be, it depends on what level of serviceability of what level of uh, damage limitation you want to assume for, for a serviceability of curvature, and the concrete compression strain could be maybe four per mil or something like that. If you use these values and you try again to plot some dimensionless, dimensionless curvature as a function of axial, of axial uh, load ratio and as a function of different values for the reinforcement uh, percentage in the walls, you see that you have uh, uh, plots in terms of curvature that are partially dominated by the uh, limit of the steel elongation and, and partially governed by the concrete, uh, the concrete limit. And of course, when you have a, a larger, uh, a larger um, reinforcement percentage and when you have a larger axial load ratio, you have more and more the concrete governing, and when you have a lower uh, axial load ratio and the lower uh, percentage of reinforcement, the steel will govern. But what, what is clear here is that there is a, a, rush, a rather, uh, well, the, the, the dimensions of the curvature are rather constant uh, as a function of these two parameters, while if you look in terms of dimensions of this moment, you have a very different curve curves representing different value of the reinforcement and as a function of the axial load ratio. This is again something that has been familiar to us if you think in terms of the curve that we were discussing yesterday where when we were uh, saying that uh, uh, strength and stiffness are related while essentially uh, the yield curvature is uh, a fixed parameter that depends only on geometry. Now, if instead of considering a serviceability limit uh, in, in the curvature and in moment, you look at some damage control, of course, what changes is that you could assume to have larger steel, larger strains in the steel and larger concrete strain. For example, assume to take 6% in the steel, and, and it's a quite a large uh, steel elongation, and assume to take a concrete strain of 1.8%. Again, this is quite a large concrete strain, and uh, uh, this is one of the reasons why I was saying that when you consider something of this sort, you need to have a good confinement because to have a, a shortening capacity of the steel of 1.8%, you need a good confinement. Now, look at these two plots. They look quite similar to the one in the previous page, but please look at the number. Y you see here the curvature is between 0.06 and 0.08, while in the previous case it was in the range of, say, 0.02. So the curvature is about four times or something like that. While if you look here at the bending moment, you are in the dimensions of the bending moment, you are, say, between four and eight, and here, you again, you are between four and eight. This is obvious. You are not increasing the bending moment, but you are increasing significantly the curvature. This uh, um, can be uh, looked at in, numerical, uh, in a numerical way, and you can see that the serviceability curvature can be around this value and the damage control curvature can be around this value. You, you see that between these two, these two values there is this fa that factor of four that I was showing in, in, in the curves. And uh, if you assume that in most cases it's the steel straight that, that, that is the limit uh, 
of the curves, then is, you, could, you could express all this, uh, both this, this expression, just saying that the uh, general limit for the curvature is 1.2 times the limit of the elongation that you use in the steel. Of course, you could do something similar if you consider that. I'm going too slowly. OK, I'm giving you too many details. <laughs> um, well, if you do this, then you can, you can obtain some design displacement profile as a sum of the, of the yield part and of the plastic part. And the plastic part is now the uh, plastic rotations times the height. So in the previous case, it was the, given by the limiting uh, the rotation at the top. Now it's given by the limiting the, uh, rotation the rotation, plastic rotation at the base. Now let's go to the, to the part uh, related to the how to design the, the, uh, the structure or the wall. And we will go again to use the usual equations. I don't need to repeat anything about these equations because they have been using also earlier for the, for the, for the case of frames. And, uh, uh, and let's go and try to evaluate the equivalence viscous damping. Uh, to, to define the equivalence viscous damping, as usual, we simply need to, to calculate what the displacement at, at the ultimate situation will be, well, the, at the design situation will be, what the, the uh, yield displacement will be to calculate uh, as the, the ratio of these two values to have a value for the, um, an estimation of the ductility and as a function of the ductility to obtain uh, the equivalent uh, uh, viscous damping. So this is the expression for the calculation of the equivalent height. For frames, this was the uh, yield displacement. For walls, this is the, this is the yield displacement. And uh, if we now uh, consider uh, the, the two different situations of the design displacement due to drift limits or the design displacements due to the uh, limitation of the strain at the base, you, we can go and, and define what the value will be. A situation that is uh, interesting to evaluate is the combination of uh, walls of different width. If you have walls of different width, as it has been discussed yesterday, it is impossible to go and have the same ductility demand in the different walls. So you end up having different values for the ductility in the walls, and therefore different values for the equivalent um, damping in the walls. We, we, in this case, we use the, the equation that we, we have been using several times. What we end up having is that the walls are going to have the same displacement if we consider that there is no relative displacement due to the infinite stiffness of the, of the floors in their own plane. And, and therefore, essentially, the equivalent damping is a combination of the damping of each wall multiplied by the strength of each wall and divided by the sum of the strength. I will, I will show an example in a few minutes. Actually, I'll show you the example right now. Uh, the, suppose that you take three walls and suppose that the design drift will control at 2%. Uh, suppose that the slab coupling is negligible. Uh, I'm, I'm doing that because the coupling will be discussed later on. I mean, considering a coupling of the, of the wall or of, uh, I mean, coupling due to the floors or coupling due to um, coupling beams. And suppose to have a certain value of the uh, mass per floor. And suppose to have a certain earthquake, for example, a 6.8 magnitude and 10 kilometers. This is, uh, this is needed to have, in an example, the response spectrum as we have been doing uh, earlier and yesterday. Now, in an example of this sort, what you will do is uh, to assume that you have a total height uh, due to four stories, 3.2 meters tall, each one of them. So the total height is 12.8 meter. And suppose that you have uh, the yield elongation of the steel, which is given by the strength of the steel, 400 megapascals divided by the elastic modules of the steel obtaining 0.2%. Uh, uh, you can then calculate uh, what the displacement at the level of each one of the floors is. And you can also calculate the square of this displacement. And you can calculate the height multiplied by this displacement. You can put all this very easily in a spreadsheet because these are the figures that you will use to go to use this 
uh, these equations where you need, as I was saying, the square of the, of the displacement and so on. So now coming here, again, you have uh, uh, the, the, the displacement at each one of the heights, the displaced to the square, and the displacement multiplied by the height. So now the design displacement, the general equation to go from a, a multi-degree of freedom structure to a single degree of freedom structure is given, is one of those equations I was showing a minute ago, which is the sum of the mass times the displacement to the square divided by the sum of the mass multiplied to the displacement. What you obtain is that the design displacement will be approximately 17 uh, centimeters. The yield displacement uh, at the effective height of the structure is given by the equation where you put the mass multiplied by the displacement multiplied by the height and divide by the sum of mass times the displacement and you will obtain that uh, the, uh, the equivalent height is at 9.765 meter which is approximately 0.76 of the total height. Of course, instead of doing that, you could have assumed an approximate height and, and you would have been uh, making a small mistake because you would have been assuming something in the range between 0.7 and 0.77 or something like that. Uh, now, if you calculate the yield displacement of the two walls, you will obtain, uh, of course, two different, uh, two different values. This is the equation. The difference for a, a wall of 4 meters and a wall of 2 meters is this part here. So you will obtain something in the range of 3.55 centimeters for the um, large wall. And you will obtain two times this because the difference is that you have a 2 instead of a 4 here in this case. Now it is immediate to calculate the wall displacement ductility factor as the ratio of the design displacement and the yield displacement. So this value will be 4.8 in the case of the 4 meter wall and 2.4 in the case of the 2 meter wall. And as a consequence, using the equations that correlate uh, the damping to the ductility, this 4.78 and this 2.39, you will obtain an equivalent damping of 16% uh, for the 4 meter wall and of 13% for the 2 meter wall. Now, the structure equivalent damping will be given by the combination of these two values combined with the strength of each, of each one of the wall. And uh, you see here, you have 0 uh, uh, the 13% here and the 16% here. Here you have the two because you have two walls of this sort. The, the total result that you obtain is 15.2%, uh, uh, which is, of course, Intermi an intermediate value between the value of the shorter wall and the value of the uh, deeper wall. Now, if you, if you go and enter with the, the design displacement, the design displacement was this value here, 17 centimeters, you enter the uh, spectral shapes that you obtain from a 6.5 magnitude at 10 kilometers with a different value of the equivalent damping, you enter with the 17 centimeters displacement, you eat the curve of the 15% damping, and you come down and you obtain a two second period of vibration. Now, with the two second period of vibration, you can calculate the stiffness of the structure. Uh, these two uh, figures are in red because I believe that in the notes are not uh, written in, 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 in the proper way, so, so correct them and you obtain the, uh, the equivalent stiffness at this value here. You also calculate the equivalent mass with the, the total mass multiplied by the sum of the displacement divided by the design displacement. And having now stiffness and mass, you can calculate the base shear that you have to use to design the structure as the multiplication of the stiffness multiplied by the design displacement at 539 kilonewton. Uh, it, is, uh, it is obvious that now you have to distribute this total shear between the, the walls, and uh, uh, this is uh, straightforward since uh, uh, considering all what we have done up to now. But then this example uh, will, may continue. You will find it in the book. Uh, it's on page uh, 106 to determine the design moment for the plastic hinges. Now, uh, I, I'll, I'll say a, a, few, a few things about iron mode effects, and then I, I leave uh, uh, Nigel to say something about the uh, coupled, coupled walls. So, uh, 
the, the two effects uh, in, in uh, the two main effects of higher mode of higher mode problems are what? There is a drift amplification, which is can be significant, uh, uh, and uh, it can be significant depending on the height of the structure. But what is more important is that there could be a moment in shear uh, amplification for protected action and members. Uh, there has been a lot of research going on on these on these aspects, and it is worthwhile to have a look first at what happens when you are designing using a force-based approach. When, when, you have, when you are using an equivalent lateral force approach, what you do is that you consider a flexural overstrength and you consider a higher mode effect. Uh, the higher mode effect factor depends normally on the number of stories that can be something in, in, uh, expressed by these equations with a maximum of 1.8. So what happens is that you have a design force that you have of this, of this sort and then, you, uh, and then you go, in terms of bending moment, you go up having a linear over strength, plus over strength, and then you have the tension, a tension stiff that you applied, and you end up having something of this, of, this, of this shape. If you look in terms of shear force profiles, what happens is that you have the design force, and then you have the over strength, and then you have the dynamic amplification. If uh, you want to consider to look at the uh, problem in terms of uh, a model response spectrum procedure. What is normally done is, uh, is well known, is a combination of the contributes uh, obtained from the different modes, uh, taking the uh, square root of the sums of the square of the, of the results for the different modes. Let's see uh, what happens. Uh, well, if, if the seismic intensity exceeds the design level, the elastic force increases. But since the uh, moment at the, at the base remains the same, also the, the Q factor, the force adduction factor increases and nothing changes. Now it's interesting to, to see what happens if you look at the, at the, at the number of cases and actually uh, the cases that will be briefly shown in the next slides are cases where uh, uh, a, n a number of uh, different number of stories have been used, uh, considering uh, a, a specific case for subsoil, but this is not so important. It could be applied for different class of subsoil, different level of, uh, of peak ground acceleration, in this case, 0.4 G, and, and going through a displacement-based design for approximately 2.4% uh, uh, drift accepted. Then there has been uh, some inelastic time history analysis using spectrum compatible records, using uh, an input ground motion, which has been in turn 50% and uh, up to 200% of the uh, 0.4 peak ground acceleration used for the design of the structures to see what happens when you are increasing the, the, the ground motion in terms of nonlinear response. So this is, these are the structure with uh, uh, a different number of stories from 2 to uh, 20 stories, all, all 3 meters uh, tall, each one of them. If you design this structure, you obtain value of uh, displacement ductility that obviously are uh, lower and lower when you increase the number of stories because uh, as, as we have been discussing, you are going towards the cases where an elastic design will, uh, will govern. You, uh, you end up with period of vibrations that are effective period of vibrations that are different and tend to increase significantly when you have uh, higher and higher structures. On this, on this aspect, it's interesting to note that if you look at the, some standard code equation to evaluate what the period of vibration on the structure will be, you obtain figures which are in the range that are shown here, uh, which uh, means, very roughly speaking, that they are in the range of uh, 0.1 or something like that second per story. This was the rule of thumb that was uh, taught to us when we were uh, students at the university. Just take the number of the story, multiply it by 0.1, and you obtain more or less the period of vibration of the structure. But if, if you look at the real cases, you see that probably uh, you should modify this rule of thumb and just say that instead of multiplying the number of stories, you should multiply the height in meters to obtain an, an, a, reasonable a reasonable evaluation of the period of vibration. So the, what I'm trying to say is that 
roughly speaking, between the, uh, some code equation that you use to evaluate the period of vibration and the realistic evaluation, there is a factor of three in most cases. And this, of course, uh, can cause a lot of problems. But this is not the subject that we have to look right now. What, what we want to see now is what happens, for example, if you look at the case of the 16-story wall and you look at the shape uh, of the bending moment uh, along the height, this, this curve here is what you obtain using uh, the, uh, the uh, elastic force. This is what you obtain if you uh, use the uh, displacement-based design approach. And this is what you obtain using uh, the combination of the uh, square root of the sum of the square. And this is what you obtain if you, uh, modif you, if you shift this shape just to go to the same level of the displacement base approach for the bending moment at the base. If you do the same and you look at the, at the distribution of the, of the shear force along the height, you see that again you can have something which is extremely different in, in, in the different cases. And you can see that the, uh, the case of uh, the combination of the uh, sum of the square root of the sum of the square divided by the, uh, divided by the ductility gets closer to the case of the uh, design with a lateral force approach. Now, what is more interesting, and we'll conclude what I have to, to, to say on, on, this, on, this aspect, on, this, on this matter, is that when you go for the full nonlinear analysis, and you do a nonlinear analysis staying with uh, something which is close to the action that you are designing for. So you go for a nonlinear analysis using a peak ground acceleration equal to 0.4 g. You obtained uh, a distribution of the mending moment, which is uh, 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 this one here, this, this one characterized by 1. You are not far away from, the, from what you were assuming. And if you do uh, an analysis with 0.5, you are not too far away. But if you increase the peak ground acceleration, and therefore you have an earthquake where the demand is larger, the distribution of the bending moment in the height, in the height along the height, change very significantly. Of course, it cannot change very significantly here, because here is where you have the formation of the plastic hinges. And therefore, this modification here is only due to the uh, strain hardening of the steel, essentially. But it changes very significantly in the sense that you can have a very large bending moment demand at upper stories. And this is the case of the eight-story wall. This is the case of the 12-story wall. And you again see this, is, this one case is the one with a peak ground acceleration equal to the design peak ground acceleration. And this is what you obtain if you go for two times that level in the nonlinear analysis. And uh, this is the eight-story wall and 12-story wall if you look in terms of shear, obviously, let's go back for a while to the, to the bending moment. If you keep the bending moment value here, but you change the shape, essentially, it is like changing the equivalent height of the structure. It's, uh, it's like having a, a certain value of the, of the, you can, the, the, the total, the, what I mean is that the bending moment is, is obtained by an equivalent shear force, the total equivalent shear force, multiplied by a height. So the only, the, the only thing that you could do that is to change the height where you apply the force. And, and this results very clearly if you look at the distribution of the shear along the height. And in this case, of course, the shear value here is very much larger than in, than in the previous case because you are keeping the mending moment and changing the equivalent height. This, of course, this means that you could, could end up having problems of shear at the lower part of the structure and problem of bending moment in the higher part of the structure, but of course also problem of shear in the higher part of the structure. And this is the case of 16-story wall and the case of a 20-story wall. And you see that the, uh, you have similar problems with the distribution of shear that could go to much larger value at the, at the base of the structure. Now the conclusion and, and, and then uh, the very few uh, last slides will, will, will show some, some proposal for a solution, is that in general model response spectra and uh, uh, elastic uh, uh, force uh, approaches underestimate the moments above the base and shear forces over the full height. The results are intensity dependent. 
or the ductility dependent if you want because when you are increasing the, uh, the intensity you are increasing the ductility demand at the, at the base of the structure and uh, we, will, we will see that uh, looking at the results it is possible to propose a simple solution that will take care and solve this problem. So let's have a look at the, at the, at the problem in terms of uh, a model combination. Nigel already uh, said something very briefly yesterday on this, on this aspect. The point, the main point is that when you apply a reduction factor to, uh, to a model analysis, you are applying this, uh, this force reduction factor to the first mode, to the second mode, to the third mode, to all the modes. But actually, only one will be uh, the mode of the structure after it has reached, for example, the plastic hinge at the base. If you assume that this, uh, say, post-elastic mode is similar to the first mode of vibration, then it will be much more reasonable to apply the force reduction factor only to the first mode, but not to apply the force reduction factor to the higher modes, because the higher modes will not take advantage of the fact that there is a plastic hinge at the base. So this, this proposal is a proposal where the shear force profile should be obtained by the inelastic first mode shear force plus the elastic second and third and whatever. Normally you don't need many, but uh, second and third and, and so on modes. And this should be done also for the case of the bending moment, where the bending moment profile could be given by the combination of the first inelastic bending moment plus the other modes in their elastic shape. And of course, they are taken to the square and taken under a square root. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, a modified, it's called model, uh, well, it has been called mod modified model superposition, and uh, it, it follows some proposal uh, by Joseph Eibler in the 70s, I believe, or something like that. If you do something like that, you obtain results that are very promising. Actually, they are very reliable. And if you look, this is what happens when you have the uh, time history analysis with the same level of action as the design action. So it was the one in the previous figure, but you see that the results are good. But what, what is, is more important is that uh, uh, they, they, seem to be, uh, they, they seem to be good even when you increase the uh, value of the, uh, of the action. And you can see that both in, in the bending moment distribution, which is uh, this and, and, and this, and this, uh, this is uh, 12 story for 1.5 times, 16 stories for 1.5 times, and 20 story for 1.5 times. And this is the case for two times the, the action. And you can see that the, the inelastic time history analysis and the modified model superposition give uh, results that are in a very close uh, uh, combination. And this is what happens uh, in, uh, to the shears, to the, to the shear distribution. This is not unexpected. If the moment are fine, also the shear should be approximately fine. And again, you see this is the uh, 0.5 intensity case. So you have an intensity which is half the design intensity. This is one. And these are the cases with uh, 1.5 and two, of, of, of course, the, the results are not perfect, uh, fine, but they are certainly much, much, much better than the case of, uh, of uh, simply using a model superposition or something in that sort. And Nigel, it's, uh, it's, your, it's your turn to go ahead with the, with the capacity design. Michele has been talking about capacity design for walls already, so really uh, there are a couple of aspects that could be considered in this. First, if you look at the previous slide that he has shown, uh, the previous two slides, you'll see that, for example, for the shear force, the agreement is much better at an intensity ratio of 1.0 than it is at the higher levels here. The modified modal superposition approach becomes more conservative as the intensity increases. And the reason for this is associated with the shifting of the periods due to ductility. If it's a rather squat wall, the first mode period tends to shift along the plateau of the seismic response here, and it doesn't change the 
amount of shear associated with it. But if it's a, a taller wall, then what happens is perhaps that the, the uh, value of the period shifts due to the modification of the period and the response, the acceleration response, actually reduces. So the, the approach which doesn't take that tension shift into account is a little conservative. The way to improve this is instead of using an elastic modified modal superposition is to use a reduced stiffness modal superposition where you reduce the stiffness of the plastic hinge to the level that you anticipate for the level of ductility uh, that is um, approached. But there's another way. We don't have to go through that level of uh, analysis because we have good results from large numbers of inelastic time history analyses. And uh, as a consequence, we can develop some rather simplified design rules that can be used in the same uh, sense as Michele showed at the very start of the section on capacity design where we have modifications to the elastic uh, moment pattern for shear and moment in existing codes. And you'll recall that in that case the, the typical situation for, uh, for, uh, for the moment pattern was a straight line distribution from top to the bottom. Now in fact what we have suggested is a modification to that where we define the relative magnitude of the moment at the center of the wall to the value at the base of the wall. And that is given by a, an expression which depends on the ductility demand. So it has that characteristic that he has mentioned that the ductility demand is an important consideration in determining the influence of the higher modes because they become more significant as the, mo as the uh, modal, as the ductility increases. So we have a system which looks something of that sort of nature, and then we can use a, I'm having trouble with this mouse, we have some, we can uh, include tension shift effects to, to terminate the reinforcement. And the same occurs for the shear force distribution. We can have a situation now where we define both the moments at the base of the wall, the shear at the base of the wall, and at the top of the wall as a function of the ductility demand. So the expression is shown here where we calculate the dynamic amplification factor, which uh, is very much larger than has been used in the, bars, in the past. And we can compare those simple expressions with the results of the, or of the uh, time history analyses. I just should mention again that in both these cases, the elastic period is one of the variables in there. So it's there and there. Now, when we take that and compare the results, the straight lines are the values that we get for different walls that we analyzed um, for the, the expressions on the previous slide, and the dots are the values from the individual time history analyses. And you can see that the agreement is very good. And so it's not necessary to do uh, an individual modified modal analysis unless you wish to, you can, with adequate accuracy, use these simple expressions. But they do differ quite a lot from what has been used in the past in codes. Something which has not really been dealt with yet, uh, though is very important uh, in walls, as it is with, with um, bridges, is the possibility of foundation flexibility and the increase in displacements that are associated with that. There are two aspects that are important. The first is that the, uh, the foundation and flexibility is going to increase the yield displacement due to the rotation of the foundation. It's fairly straightforward to calculate this value. It will also increase the, um, it will increase the the design displacement if it is based on limit-based strains. It won't, of course, if it's based on drifts. So we need to determine what influence that will have on the design displacement. Uh, it may mean that the design displacement is exactly the same because the drift limit is already governing the design, or it may mean that the design displacement increases a little bit. The second influence that we need to take into account is the influence on the effective damping that we need to take. And we see in this case that 
we need to take the amount of displacement that is uh, from foundation flexibility and multiply that by the appropriate damping because the soil foundation rotation normally has a higher level of damping associated with it than normal structural response. It depends on the rotational angle and information is given in the book on that. So we need to weight the displacement and damping of the foundation and of the structure to determine what the equivalent structural damping is. And with that modified displacement and the modified damping, we can go about the foundation design in the usual sort of fashion. And there's an example given of the influence of this and of determining what the amount of foundation rotation would be uh, at different levels of response and comparing that with uh, the structural displacements. You can see that this particular example is very squat. It has a height of 18 meters and a length of 8 meters. And the foundation is designed for a factor of safety for static loads of 6. And with that information and some information on the stiffness of the soils, we can determine the distribution of the foundation forces in terms of stress and also in terms of strains so we can look at the rotations. Um, there are a couple of aspects that are important here. What we find from this particular example is that even with that fairly high factor of safety for the soil stresses, we find that at the yield of the structure, the displacement, of the, the displacement at the center of height caused by foundation rotation is of a similar magnitude to that of the structural aspects again. So it's a very significant amount to be taken into account. Uh, and this is just the, the, the conclusion that we have here. You can see at the bottom of this, we find that the structural yield displacement is 41 millimeters and the displacement from foundation rotation is 45 millimeters. And that implies a very considerable modification to the design in terms of displacement-based design. And this must be considered. There's a, a considerable amount of emphasis given in the, this chapter of the book on the torsional design using displacement-based design. And I should say right from the start here that much of the information that is in this section uh, has been based on work that, uh, uh, that Castillo himself here has, has done. Rolando Castillo did his PhD with Professor Tom Paule in New Zealand on uh, the torsional response of systems. Uh, we took that work and another student did some further developments from that and that has led to the, uh, to the conclusions that are, are incorporated in the book. And we look at two systems, uh, torsionally unrestrained systems, which um, would seem to imply, this is on the left-hand side, that when uh, one of these walls reaches the inelastic range, a range uh, uh, inelastic response level, then what will happen is that the, the wall will have no torsional stiffness at all and will have unrestrained uh, swinging. In fact, that is restrained by the torsional mass inertia, the distributed mass of the floor system, so it's not quite as bad as an anticipated. But we can distinguish between that type of system and the system here, which is torsionally restrained, so that if this wall and or this wall here yield, we have torsional stiffness still remaining in the other walls. Now, I won't have time to go through in any detail the approach that has been uh, developed, but we do have first a method for uh, determining the, uh, the likely response, the torsional response of an existing system, and also how to incorporate this within the, uh, the design of a displacement-based design procedure. The first thing, though, from a design point of view is to emphasize that elastic analysis doesn't give you the right answer. Doing an elastic analysis tells you to distribute the forces in proportional to the displacement in the elastic sense. What happens after you get to the inelastic response stage is that the elastic torsional stif stiffness is irrelevant. And the most important characteristic for determining whether or not you are getting significant torsional displacements and rotations is the strength eccentricity, 
not the stiffness eccentricity. So the strength eccentricity is just a matter of looking at the, all of the elements that have seismic resistance in one direction, looking at what their, their moment capacities and, and therefore their shear capacities are, working out the center of that uh, distributed number of uh, walls and comparing that with the center of mass. And a design choice that you can do from the start is to forget about the stiffness eccentricity and try to minimize that strength eccentricity. And if you do that, you will minimize the torsional response. So you have much more control over the torsional response of a building, and particularly frame, uh, wall buildings, if you ignore the apparent uh, the stiffness eccentricity, but try to minimize the strength eccentricity. However, given a certain uh, strength eccentricity or a stiffness eccentricity, the, the one the, with the top yellow arrow is the uh, stiffness eccentricity, the bottom one is the strength eccentricity. We can determine something or other where we calculate what the effects are in terms of the rotation of the floor plan and the, this is, looks very similar to what we might use in an elastic approach except for the fact that this stiffness here, this torsional stiffness, is different from the elastic torsional stiffness. It takes into account the fact that the walls themselves, once they get into the inelastic range, have a reduced secant stiffness, as we would look at in the displacement-based design. So you'll see that in this expression for the torsional stiffness, if I can get this here, for the walls that are in the direction of the excitation, we divide the elastic stiffness by the displacement ductility demand. And that makes a big difference to the overall response. We take that into account and we determine the displacements by multiplying the, uh, the calculated rotation by the strength eccentricity of the individual elements itself. And if we look at this approach, which I'm not explaining very well, but hopefully is a bit clearer if you look at the, the book itself, we find that we can get a very good prediction of the, uh, the displacements of an eccentric system where there's a short wall and a long wall and of the center of mass using a displacement-based design approach for both um, this uh, unrestrained system here. This is uh, using data that was, um, was uh, developed by Castillo. And this one on this side here, torsionally restrained, walls uh, using data provided by Katrin Bayer, who did her PhD fairly recently at the Rose School. And we can get very accurate uh, results from this. And there is a design approach in the book which is, uh, which is developed to try and minimize the torsional response, but to show how you can incorporate this in displacement-based design at the start of the design process. Now, I think I'll carry on with this uh, couple of walls. It may mean that we go a few minutes over in terms of uh, the, the lunch break, but hopefully you'll forgive me for that. Um, coupled walls, well, Michele has already talked about this. It could be walls that are coupled by spandrel beams, or it could be walls that are coupled by floor slabs. But the influence in all of these cases is that the strength and stiffness of the coupling element results in there being uh, vertical forces induced in the walls that are coupled, which creates a frame-like action very similar to what we talked about in frames. So part of the overturning moment is carried by axial forces in the walls as well as by moments at the bases of the walls. Just showing an example here with a combination of actually coupled walls here and simple cantilever walls here. Rather difficult to deal with in a force-based design approach but very straightforward in a displacement-based design approach. We're concerned about a, the, the potential, particularly for the failure of the spandrel beams or the coupling beams itself. Of course, another alternative is uh, in, in shorter walls to have failure of the walls themselves, but that's not really a coupled wall. So we're concerned about this behavior here, and we also see that this is reproduced in experiments. And uh, this happens to be taken from Professor Tom Pauley's uh, PhD thesis. So this was the testing that he did 
looking at conventionally reinforced spandrel beams and you can see that there has been very bad damage to these coupling beams, the spandrel beams, and almost no damage to the base of the wall. Some damage but nowhere near as much. So you can see that in this case the coupling beams have completely disintegrated due to shear and the failure has occurred. And Tom suggested that the behavior would, and proved experimentally, that the behavior would be greatly improved if instead of having conventional horizontal reinforcement and vertical shear reinforcement, that you use diagonal reinforcement uh, because of the fact that this acts as truss elements. And uh, essentially the, the reinforcement in one direction is in tension over its full length, the reinforcement in the other direction is in compression over the full length, and the reinforcement carries both the flexor and the shear and provides much, much greater ductility capacity. Let's look at the sort of animal that we're talking about in general. We're typically talking about a, a structure which contains a gravity frame and floor slabs, plus uh, coupled walls, which in plan view perhaps uh, contain the, the shear core, which provides the strength resistance, but also provides the facilities such as lifts and uh, toilet facilities and so forth. We see that typically what is happening, we're expecting that the, the beams in themselves will have uh, moments induced in them. And if we extrapolate those moments to the uh, center lines of the walls, obviously they induce moments in the walls themselves and they induce coupling forces, the tension and compression forces, which can be found from the shear in the coupling beam. So you can see that from an equilibrium point of view, we're looking at something which is only different in geometry rather than in general form to a frame building. Some general characteristics. The bending moments are developed in the beams, inducing axial forces in the walls in the same fashion as with frames. So we expect to develop beam plastic hinges. Individual walls resist a proportion of the overturning moment by flexure. Uh, so we have wall-based moments. So we also expect to have plastic hinges at the base of the walls itself. And we can write the same expression, essentially, that we had for frames when we did that equilibrium analysis to say that the overturning moment is, which is provided by the lateral forces multiplied by the heights above the base, is equal to the sum of the two moments at the bases of the walls plus the frame action, the tension in the tension wall multiplied by the distance from its center line to the center of the compression wall. So we have exactly the same expression. And we have the expression that that tension force is just equal to the sum of the beam shears up the height of the building itself. So we have a very simple equilibrium equation that can be used for design. We note that the structure is stiffer than individual walls which are linked by totally flexible slabs and as a consequence the drifts are reduced and the ductility demand is increased. As a consequence we can design the structure with smaller wall sizes which is convenient from an architectural viewpoint and also from an economic viewpoint. Typically the structural system is completed by flat slab floors and by prop, can, uh, prop conals, columns. And the most important thing to remember is that the ductility demands on the coupling beams are very high as we saw from those experimental results and as McKelly had mentioned earlier in this lecture. And as a consequence the special detailing is required as we mentioned uh, beforehand using diagonal reinforcement preferably. And the little diagram on the left hand side of this slide relates the, the wall drift to the drift in the coupling beams. And you can determine this by simple geometry using this expression here. The coupling beam drift is equal to the beam drift, uh, the wall drift at that level, multiplied by one plus the wall length divided by the length of the coupling beam. And typically that gives you a ratio of something like three or maybe even four. So if you have a maximum code drift for the building of 
2%, then you may be implying that your walls, your coupling beams, have drifts of 6% or 7%, which is extremely large. So it's not surprising that we see them uh, failing. Now, I just want to see, yeah. If we look at the overall performance then, we can say on the left-hand side, that's the overturning moment up the height of the building, resulting from the lateral forces itself. Um, we note that we can look at the coupling beam moments. If we know what those moments are, we can determine how the resistance to the overturning moment from the coupling beams is, is, is distributed up the height. After all, if we know the moment capacity, then we know what the shear is of each of the beams. If we know what the shear is, we can sum them up the full height of the building and then multiply them by the distances between the wall center lines, and that will give us the contribution of the coupling beams to resisting the moment in the walls. And we can then determine that the moments in the walls themselves will be the difference between these two moment diagrams, the overturning moment and the coupling beam moments itself. Well, from the start, we can determine a, a particular ratio, which we're using the civil beta coupling beam, as the moment at the base, the resisting moment at the base, which is a, from the coupling beams themselves, divided by the overturning moment. So it's the percentage of the overturning moment at the base, which is carried by the coupling beams. Obviously, 1 minus beta, then, is the percentage of the moment at the base which is carried by the walls. And what I'm stating right from the start, then, is this value of beta should not come from a stiffness analysis, but is a designer's choice. So you look at this and you say, I'm going to decide that that value is 50% or 20% or 70%. Why? Well, because we know that the stiffness analyses are going to be very inaccurate. Conventional design of coupling walls is based on elastic analysis. And what we find is that because of the different ductility demands in the walls and in the beams, the coupling beams typically yield at a very small fraction of the force at which the walls start to yield. So before you get to anything like the strength of resistance of the structure, we have already changed the distribution of stiffness from the elastic value. So the walls are yielding very early, sorry, the, the coupling beams are yielding very early, the walls are still elastic. You go a bit further and then the walls start to yield. You have get something or other which an elastic stiffness-based analysis will not give you any good feel for what's happening itself. So on the basis of that, the designer can choose without, within limits, naturally, the proportion of the total overturning moment to be carried by coupling action and the percentage to be carried by wall flexure. Something else that we can do right from the start, which is again forgetting about what happens in elastic analysis, to say, all right, if I choose that 50% of the overturning moment is carried by the, uh, the, the coupling beams, then I can distribute that up the wall as I see fit. And in this case, the most logical thing to do is in fact to distribute that shear force uniformly up the height of the building to make all of those coupling beams the same. You don't have to make that assumption. You can make whatever assumption you like, but again, I would emphasize that that's a designer's choice. So typically what we will do is we will choose that between 25 and 75 percent of the overturning moment is carried by the coupling beams. How do we decide that value? Well, it's a, it's a designer's choice, but I think that one thing that you should do is to ensure that if you, take, you know, if you carry too much of the overturning moment by the coupling beams, then what will happen is that the wall, which is in tension for the direction that you're under consideration, will actually, the seismic tension force will exceed the gravity load on it. And I think that that's not a good idea. So the upper limit should be the value of the beta, which will keep that tension wall still in compression and stop it sliding along the base. Anyway, a typical value is going to be in the vicinity of 50%. We then can say if we have uniform shear in all coupling beams, 
then we can determine what the shear in each coupling beam is, that's just beta times the overturning moment, divided by the length between the centers of the walls and by the number of stories in. And if we know what those shears are, we can determine what the design moments are for the coupling beams. Of course, at the start of the design process, we only know this as in relative terms, not in absolute terms, because we don't know what the overturning moment is until we know what the design is. But we need this information to determine what the uh, level of damping is. So to proceed with the design, we need to determine the yield displacements of the walls, the yield drift of the coupling beams, the design displacement of the structure, the corresponding drifts of the coupling beams, the ductility demand on the walls, the ductility demand of the coupling beams, and hence the global ductility demand, and hence the design based shear force in the usual fashion. And then we can go back to our assumptions and distribute that force through the structure. Now it can be a little bit onerous to do this, so we've provided a series of design charts which are relevant for, uh, for coupling beams in which we look at a number of aspects as a function of the number of stories. Uh, first of all, we determine the effective height, as shown here. Sorry, I'll go back to that. The effective height, of, uh, which is independent of the coupling itself, we have something here where we have the dimensionless yield displacement as a function of the coupling beam ratio and the number of stories. So we can feed that into a very simple expression. And we have something else which is important, which is the height of the contraflexure point in the walls as a fraction of the total building height and as a fraction of the, the coupling beam ratio. The reason that this is important is that if you think about it, that point of contraflexure is where the drift will be a maximum in the building itself. So when you compare behavior with the code drift limit, you need to know what the height of the contraflexure point is because that's the critical location for drift. Once you get above that, the drift reduces because the moments are heading in the opposite direction. So looking at that, uh, whoops. We have an expression there which is shown uh, for the effective height and then graft. We have an expression here for the displacement in a simple sense here, just C4, which is given by this graph here, times the yield curvature at the base of the wall, which we know from the walls, times the height uh, of the wall itself, the, to the full height of the wall squared, and then also the expression here for the uh, height of the contraflexure point, noting that this will be a maximum at this, the drift will be a maximum at this location. We've already mentioned that the ratio of the, of the uh, coupling beam drift to the wall drift at any location is dependent on the geometry itself. And as a consequence, we can look at what the relation for the coupling beam drift would be when we get to the yield drift of the wall itself from the expression that we have there. So if we look at this, um, we, sorry, if we look at this expression here, we can take the, the rotation of the wall itself at the uh, contraflexure height, which is where the drift will be a maximum itself. We say that we just take the yield drift uh, which is uh, shown here, and we multiply that by that relationship, and that gives us what the maximum coupling beam drift will be at the wall drift, at the wall yield. And we can compare that with the coupling beam yield drift itself. This is just to get some idea as to which is going to yield first, the coupling beams or the wall. We know the answer, but we don't know the relative magnitudes. So here we have something or other which depends on the plastic hinge length, and also incorporate some shear flexibility into it down at the bottom. And we need to compare those two expressions. So we take an example of 12 stories, the total height 42 meters, wall length 5.6 meters, coupling beam fairly long, 1.8 meters, and the coupling beam depth 0.75 meters, fairly common but could easily be more, and we're designing for a coupling beam ratio of 0.5. 
When we look then at the coupling beam drift at the, when the wall, sorry, it's a bit, when the uh, coupling beam drift when the wall just yields is given by that upper equation here, and you can see that we can relate that to the yield strain of the reinforcement, and the number, the numeric values for this particular example is 16.2 times the yield drift, and we can compare that with the coupling beam yield drift itself, and we find that is 1.9 times the yield drift. So that relative magnitude lets you know as to the relative displacements, if you like, of when the, the uh, coupling beam is going to yield and when the wall is going to yield. And you can see the ratio in this case is 8.5. So to imagine that you can get any reasonable idea of what the response of such a structure is by an elastic analysis which assumes that they're going to yield at the same time is clearly nonsense. So I can't, well, I'll go very quickly through these last few slides here. The structure design displacement may be governed by one of three different aspects. It could be governed by the wall drift at the contraflexure height, which is the code limit. It could be governed by the wall base plastic rotation capacity dependent on the limit state strains uh, at the wall base. Or more commonly, it could be governed by the coupling beam drift ratio which will be different if we have a diagonally reinforced design or a conventionally reinforced design. And details are given of this itself. So as far as the wall design displacement is concerned, the wall-based material strains, we can just use the values for a rectangular wall and determine what the design displacement would be on the basis of that, straightforward. As far as the wall drift is concerned, the wall drift is a maximum at the contraflexure height, and we can determine the displacement again just by assuming the yield drift is uh, linearly distributed up the height, and then we have a plastic component which is the code drift limit theta c minus the elastic yield rotation times the effective height itself. Straightforward. So determining those two cases those two options are comparatively straightforward. The coupling beam, uh, it's a bit more difficult, but we can determine the relationship again between the coupling beam drift and the wall drift. So first of all, we calculate the coupling beam drift as a relationship, uh, well, as governed by the maximum strain in the flexural reinforcement. So if we take uh, a conventional reinforcement case, we would say that for the damage control limit state, maximum strain of 0.6 times the strain at maximum stress. Uh, the plastic hinge length is going to be equal to twice the strain penetration length because the beams are very short. And then if we divide that, that uh, curvature by the effective height, we get the rotation itself. And we then can, from that, determine what the actual uh, corresponding drift would be in the wall at that corresponding drift in the coupling beam. So we've just inverted the expression there. And that then tells us what the, the limit based on that would be. If we have a diagonally reinforcement case, we have a more efficient system with more strain uh, uniformly distributed through the system, and the coupling, the critical coupling beam drift is rather larger. So typically we can determine which of those is critical and go through the design. We can determine the equivalent viscous damping, which is based on the proportion of the overturning moment carried by the coupling beams and by the walls. So we would say then that the damping for the system is one minus beta times the wall damping plus beta times the beta coupling beam times the coupling beam damping. And we note that the coupling beam damping will be high because of the very high ductility demand that we have. However, the, ductling, the, the ductility will not be uniformly distributed up the height of the building, and a value of about two-thirds of the maximum ductility demand is appropriate. And there is a design example going through this, and those of you who have the books, in uh, page 383, and I recommend reading this. <laughs> 